Every Sunday morning, you hit snooze. Once, maybe twice. You blow dry, you button down, you buckle up. You squeeze into your Sunday best. You keep your hands and feet and neckties in the car at all times. You come early. You run late. You sing. You listen. You preach. You pray. And then you go. And wherever you are led to go, wherever you dream of going, we are there. We are the North American Mission Board with tools, with training, with two different pathways. We connect you and your church to your next missional opportunity. When you want to welcome a refugee who's lonely, when you want to rescue a teenager who's trafficked, or feed a man who's hungry, when you want to care for a child who's neglected, or rebuild a home that's flooded, Send Relief gives you and your church real-life opportunities to learn and do in places where churches are not, where the population is big, but the gospel influence is small, where missionaries are called to start something from nothing. Send Network gives resources and training and support. And Send Network connects your church with church planners so that together you can change the world. There are thousands of them. Church planning missionaries. Send relief missionaries. In big cities and small towns. Feeding and teaching and loving. Planning 25 churches every single Sunday and baptizing thousands of new believers every single year. They give their lives and you give your treasure. You send these missionaries out into the world when you and your church sacrificially give to the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering and the Cooperative Program. And there are thousands more chaplains in foxholes and police cars and hospitals and workplaces. They all need you. And you need them. Because outside the four walls of your church, where they are, that's where you are at your best. Every believer really can one day live on mission. You and your church just need the very best tools to make it happen. That's why we exist. That's why we create resources like the Three Circles. Because whether it's an evangelism tool you download to your phone, or a compassion ministry our Send Relief experts help you launch, or a new church you help start through the Send Network, everything we do is centered on helping you and your church share the gospel. That's why we all do what we do every Sunday morning and every day after that. So as you pray, as you go, and as you discover what living on mission looks like in your world, the North American Mission Board is here for you. Bye. 
patience crushed for our sins the punishment that brought us peace was upon him by his wounds by his wounds we are healed It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter's are sleeping. Judas is betraying. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running light sheep without a shepherd mary's crying peter is denying but they don't know that sundays are coming it's friday the romans beat my jesus they robe him in scar they crown him with thorns but they don't know that sundays come it's friday See Jesus walking to Calvary, his blood dripping, his body stumbling, and his spirit's burden. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laugh. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. And stars they wept, the morning sun was dead, the savior of the world was fallen, his body on the cross, his blood poured out us, the weight of every curse upon
your son from the grave, and we get to celebrate that today. Forever will your name be lifted high, Jesus. We just praise your name forever today. You are a living hope. We can trust you no matter what's going on. We have today, we have Easter, we have the fact that you rose from the dead. And we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, he is risen. And that's why we celebrate today. Uh, Christ rose from the grave so that we could be with the Father forever. Today we invite you to celebrate with us, worship with us, as we look back on what Christ has done for us, what he's still doing for us today, and what he's going to do uh, to redeem humanity, uh, fully bring us into his presence in the future. Lord, uh, thank you for today. You are our living hope. Sing this, uh, sing this song with us this morning. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven, spoke your name. To the night and through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my Lord. Great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. Forgiven, the King of Kings calls me His own. 
that you are our living hope today. Lord, we declare this morning that you are great. We declare this morning that you are mighty. We declare this morning that you have what's best for us, God in mind. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your presence. Move in this place. Move in the hearts of those, God, viewing at home. You're incredible, Lord.
we have on this Easter Sunday morning. Lord, as Pastor Cody comes to deliver uh, Lord's message to us, God, let it speak to our hearts. Let it change us, God. Even through the internet, if somebody God has not heard of you, they don't know who you are, they don't know, haven't experienced your grace. God, let them experience that for the first time this morning. It is an honor, Lord, and a privilege to worship you today. Speak through your word. We love you. It is in Jesus, risen, in holy name we pray. Amen. 
Hey, happy Resurrection Day, everyone. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Jesus is alive today forevermore. Amen. He is not in the tomb. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. Sin could not shame him. Satan could not defeat him. Jesus, he is alive forever. Amen. Last week we talked about how Jesus, he is our king and he is our courageous king. He's our sovereign king. He's our reliable king, our trustworthy king, our praiseworthy king king and he is no longer in the tomb he is alive today is resurrection day and we're going to be studying all about the resurrection of our king jesus christ if you have your bible and i hope that you do turn open to john chapter 20 John chapter 20, we're going to look at verses 1 through 10. And this passage is all about the power and of the gospel. That Jesus, he is alive. That the suffering servant is suffering no longer, but he is now glorified and alive. But not everyone believes this truth. Not everyone believes the truth of the resurrection. Uh, there's some people that, that believe that maybe Mary Magdalene and her group of ladies, they actually went to the wrong tomb. <clears throat> that maybe perhaps they were just so grief-stricken, uh, so full of despair, uh, that they missed the 50, 80 guards that were placed outside of Jesus' tomb and the gigantic seal that Pilate had put on there. In case you can't tell, I'm being pretty sarcastic. No other tomb had Roman soldiers guarding it like that. No other tomb had a big seal placed by Pontius Pilate on it. Um, and, and, and let's just say that they did get the tomb wrong. Um, why wouldn't the Jewish leaders just go ahead and go to the right tomb and produce the body of Jesus when the disciples began to become bold? It's a good question. Um, uh, others, they might think that Jesus, he just passed out, that he just swooned on the cross, that he didn't really die. Uh, there's a couple of problems with that. The one, first one is that he was stabbed in the lungs, uh, which is a mortal wound uh, today, uh, even with our modern medicine, even more so uh, back in uh, that time. But even if Jesus did recover from the wound, let's just say that he did uh, re recover from that. I doubt that a raspy, half-dead, covered in his own filth and blood, Jesus, would inspire the disciples to be willing to suffer persecution, poverty, torture, and anguish for the rest of their lives. Instead of Jesus being the Lord of life and the Prince of Peace, he would be more or less uh, an obscure prophet from Nazareth. But some people, they think that Jesus' body, it was stolen. While these guards slept, these well-trained Roman soldiers who were in a war zone where Hebrew nationalists could actually attack at any moment, yeah, they went to sleep. Uh, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 11, it says that some of the guard. This means that there was more than two. Uh, there's pictures of tombs standing at, the, uh, pictures of the guards standing by the tomb, and it's always with two. There were, there were tons of guards around this tomb. Um, it says that some of the guard, they went into the city and told the priests all that, take, that had taken place. Two isn't some, uh, and, and two isn't all, uh, or, or, or some isn't all. It just, it's some, and we know that there were a whole bunch of them. Pilate, he didn't just give a couple or a few. He provided good, good and full protection for those religious leaders. Uh, but that wasn't going to be enough to defeat our King Jesus. Why don't we uh, take a look at John's account in John chapter 10, uh, John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. It says this, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came and uh, came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, 
not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Let's pray. God, we just uh, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this Resurrection Sunday where we can remember uh, your victory, your conquering of sin and death and hell. And God, we just thank you for that eternal hope, that living hope that is only found in you. Help us to celebrate your resurrection, not this day, but every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the first day of the week that is mentioned here in verse 1 is our Sunday morning. It's what we call Sundays the Lord's Day. Uh, We celebrate the Lord's Day by remembering uh, God, by remembering who our King is, by attending church, by uh, listening to the preaching of God's Word, uh, by taking part in communion, uh, observing baptism, by having fellowship with one another. Uh, This is how we celebrate the Lord's Day this day, and it's on this first day of the week that Mary Magdalene goes with several other women. In the other Gospels, they detail out a lot of the other women that were there. Uh, But John, he decides to focus in on Mary Magdalene. And here she is, she comes to the tomb, and this is the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Mary is there to cover Jesus' body with ointment, with spices, to prepare him for a proper burial. Now, in these days, they didn't have modern embalming techniques to preserve the body. Upon Jesus' death, he would have immediately began the process of decomposition, which begins with the uh, liquefying of the innards. Three to five days after the body has been dead, the body bloats, bloody foam begins to leak out of the mouth and the eyes, um, and... Um, this is, this is something that Mary Magdalene is willing to do, is to go and prepare Jesus' body. This smelly, bloated mass. Jesus, he had suffered a lot of trauma, and she's ready to do something disgusting, to do something necessary to serve Jesus. Now, it's early morning, and Matthew, it says it was t- toward dawn, Luke, it says that he was, it was at early dawn. Mark, it says that the sun had risen. So are these contradictions? A- actually not. I love how the authors write this because it's all from these different perspectives. Um, you know, uh, the way that Joseph's tomb lies, it's actually right in the shadow of the Mount of Olives. And so you do have Joseph's tomb laying right in the darkness of the mountain, but you have the sun rising just on the other side that's beginning to illuminate the sky. So you have all these different ways of phrasing exactly that it's early morning. Um, I love it. They just share their testimony. They share their story. It's great. But point number one is that she is performing her discretionary duty. She's there early. She's She's not doing it herself. She's there to serve Jesus however she can, even though she thinks that he's dead and gone and she can't see him, she still wants to serve him. And, and that is a good pointer for you and I as believers because even though we don't have Christ here with us physically, he is always closer than a brother. He is always present. He is always with us. He always sees us. He always knows us. And he is always really present with us. And so when God gives us opportunities to serve him, we should not only obey, but we should have these different characteristics that Mary has. Uh, The first one is that she has a plan to get it done, right? Uh, They've all probably talked about what are they going to do? Uh, in order to prepare Jesus' body. 
Uh, what tasks need to be accomplished? What supplies do they need to have with them? Who's going to talk to the, co- uh, to the guards? Um, who's going to pick up the body? Who's going to unwrap it? Who's going to rewrap it? Who's going to rub the spices on him? All these things they've probably already considered. And the second thing is that they do it as soon as possible. It, it's just finished with the Sabbath. They don't wait to serve. It's early morning. I know Christians who say, well, if you, want me, if you ask me to do something, I'll do it, okay? But if you don't ask me, I'm not going to do anything. And listen, that is just a selfish attempt at humility to say, I'm willing if you ask me. If you see a need, meet a need. We are all called to be ministers. We are all called to be missionaries. And so we as Christians have to go out of our way to serve others in a way that's beneficial to others. Um, Now, when Mary, she gets her group and they get to the tomb, they realize that all of their planning really has been for nothing. It's kind of like my vision for 2020. It's just gone out the window. Uh, They get to the tomb. And and in Luke chapter 24, verses 4 through 11, it it says this. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with him, uh, with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. You know, they thought that all of this planning had gone out the window, but listen, the reward for their preparedness was being the first to see the empty tomb. That's a pretty great reward for just being prepared. In John chapter 20, verse 2, it says, So she ran, and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, this is John, the one who is writing this account, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid uh, laid him. These disciples, they have been put through the ringer since Thursday night. And now their Lord's body is gone. Point number two, look at the disciples' actions. The disciples are going to be doing three things here. John chapter 20, verses 3 through 6. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping in to look, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came and following him and went into the tomb. The first thing that you, that you will notice here is that the disciples, they are running. And they've been running since the Garden of Gethsemane. They're running scared. And they're like sheep without a shepherd. They are directionless. They are leaderless. They are hopeless. Their entire lives and livelihood they have forsaken in order to follow Christ. And so they're running. They're running. Uh, second thing that you notice is that they are looking. Now, what are they looking for? They're looking for the body of Jesus. It, it must have been pretty eerie to walk into the garden. This place that should have been packed with soldiers is completely abandoned. You might see a spear or a helmet. Uh, you might see trampled ground from where 50, 80 soldiers were standing. So you're looking for evidence. Where, where did Jesus' body go? Where did the guards take it? Did, did robbers come and get it? They are looking, and not only that, but they are seeking. John, he is the first to get to the tomb. He makes that abundantly clear that he beat Peter in a foot race. Uh, But Peter, he was the first to go inside. Now, he had to go in. He wanted to see for himself. He wanted to look for the evidence. The body, it should be wrapped up here. I want you to understand something, that before this morning, the disciples, the women, the leaders of the apostles, they weren't expecting Jesus to rise from the dead, even though he had expressly said it. 
Okay, this truth about the empty tomb is a truth that only the Holy Spirit of God can reveal to people. People, they might mentally acknowledge it. They might say, yes, it is a truth. Maybe it is a a fact, but they may not embrace it as an actual life-changing, historical, meaningful event. John MacArthur, he said that the truth of the resurrection gives life to every area of gospel truth. The resurrection is the pivot on which all Christianity turns and without which none of the other truths would much matter. Without the resurrection, Christianity would be so much wishful thinking, taking its place alongside all other human philosophy and religious speculation. Listen to what the religious leaders say in Matthew chapter 28. They are told personally by the guards what has happened. They have experienced the resurrection of Jesus. And while they were going, verse 11, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with all the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while you were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And the story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Those guards, those religious leaders, the leaders of of the Sanhedrin, uh, they knew that Jesus was alive. What were they to do with this information. They could either reject him or they could receive him as Lord. And so the question for you is, what are you going to do with it? Are you running? Are you running scared? Especially during this coronavirus season, okay? Go to the empty tomb. See that the body is not there. Be encouraged by the living hope of the resurrection. Are you looking for an answer? Go to the empty tomb. Jesus, he doesn't need a tomb. And he is on his throne right now, ruling and reigning and interceding for his children. Are you seeking truth? Listen, there is no greater truth than Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. This is our risen king. So we have the duty of the women, the disciples' actions, and finally, point number three, discerning eyes. Look at the passage in John chapter 20, verse 6. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. Now, a discerning eye is going to notice a couple of things. First thing is the empty tomb. This is the distinctiveness of Christianity. This is why we celebrate Resurrection Day. It's what the day is all about. However, as believers, we don't just remember Jesus' resurrection today. We remember Jesus' resurrection every single day. Uh, We remember it every day because it is the fuel of faith for the believer. And it's because he lives that we have confidence that we will live and rule and reign with him forever. The discerning eye will also notice notice the linen cloths. Now, these are the grave wrappings. If the disciples or the grave robbers were stealing a body that was a bloated, bloody mess, they wouldn't have taken the time to unwrap it. I guarantee you that. The religious leaders, they wouldn't have even wanted to touch the body. And so they would have left the wrappings on too. If you're trying to get a body out quickly without getting caught, you're not going to unwrap it. And the fact that the linen cloths were just lying there is a testimony to the fact that he is not dead, but he is in fact alive. But the discerning eye is also going to notice the face cloth. And this wasn't like the linen cloth that bound the body. This was covering the face and it was neatly folded. Once again, someone that's trying to take something quickly isn't going to take the time to neatly fold something and leave it there for everyone to notice. Now, these evidences do not point to Jesus' resurrection being an ethereal event, but an actual physical resurrection. And it is the most important event in all of human history. And without the resurrection, listen, the cross has no power 
Tim Keller, he once said that if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything that he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 14 through 17, it says, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misre misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Listen, if Christ hadn't risen again, he would have no power over life or death, no victory over sin, no defeat over Satan, Christianity. It would just be a complete fairy tale. But because of the resurrection of Christ, the actual historical event which took place, we can have a hope that because Christ died and that he rose again, that we, even though we die, we may yet live. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus is alive, and it is because of the resurrection that we have any semblance of a living hope. Jesus, he is not dead. He is alive. But look at what happens next. Then the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, went in. He saw and he believed. For as yet they, the other disciples, did not understand the scriptures, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their home. But what do you think that they did when they went back home, Peter and John? But John, he believed the resurrection. And Mary, Jesus' mother, is back at John's home. I think that one of the first things that he did was he shared the good news of Christ's resurrection with Jesus' mother. This resurrection of Christ, here's what happened is that spurred people to meet and it stirred up rumors in the city that Christ was alive. It stirred people to pray and meet together. It stirred people to evangelize and eventually change the world. So my question to you is, what will you do with the empty tomb of Jesus? Head, hand, heart, head. Here's what I want you to know. That Christians have a living hope through Jesus Christ. You can only know that hope by trusting in Christ alone. And maybe in your home right now, you can ask a family member or a friend, or even yourself, if they know Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord. Today may be the day, this resurrection day, that they experience a resurrection in their own life. Repent and believe on Christ. Ha hand, here's what I want you to do. I want you to share the gospel with yourself and with someone that you know this week. Call them up. Share with them about the eternal hope that you have in Christ. Share about the empty tomb and the transformational power of God in your life. Heart, here's what I want you to believe. I want you to believe that Jesus is really alive. And if you struggle with evidences behind the resurrection, in the description below in the link, there will be 10 evidences for the resurrection just as a faith-building thing. Listen, I, I, I love you, and I pray that you have an awesome and amazing resurrection day worshiping our Lord and Savior today and every day. Why don't we spend a little bit of time in prayer? And so, God, we do thank you so much uh, just for your kindness, your mercy, Lord, that you died the death that we fully deserve in order to give us eternal life, which we are totally undeserving of. Thank you for your grace and your kindness. And I just ask, Lord, that maybe right now uh, someone uh, would repent and believe on you. Help us, God, to be your ambassadors 
to this world that desperately needs it. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. We serve a risen Savior.